So we are software developers and sometimes we create bugs, uh, but some bugs might have worse consequences than, than others. And uh, some devices become famous because of their bugs, like this one. Uh, maybe you heard about this, the Thera 25 radiotherapy device from the 1980s. And this one is uh, actually had a bunch of bugs that unfortunately killed some people, injured other people, and has become one of the like model projects of what can happen when software go wrong. And uh, to just take a step back, what is radiotherapy? That's when you use radiation to treat cancer or other, some uh, other conditions. And uh, this is what I'm working with. My daily job is at Electa, when we de develop these kind of machines. Uh, we use C++ a lot. And uh, um, the company is based here in Stockholm. And by the way, we are hiring, so we need C++ developers. I'm gonna talk more about it later. So, radiotherapy, it uh, has been around in, uh, all the way back since Marie Curie when she uh, discovered X-rays. And they realized that if you have uh, radiation that is strong enough, you can kill cells that you don't want, like cancer cells, for example. And uh, cancer cells are more uh, susceptible to uh, radiation damage than healthy cells because they can rebuild themselves or repair themselves as good as healthy cells. Um, usually, uh, when you, in radiotherapy machines, you use something called a linear accelerator to create the radiation. And uh, um, there are other ways as well, but this is the, the one that I'm gonna talk about today and is the one, one of the two kind of machines that we do at Electa. When it comes to uh, accelerator-based machines, you have um, uh, two common type of radiation beams. You have X-ray and you have electron beams and you use them for different kinds of tumors. And you also have proton beams, but that's more rare and those devices are pretty big and very expensive. So I'm gonna talk about the first two ones today. So what is a linear accelerator? Um, Basically, you have a, a current here and you generate a cloud of electrons and you accelerate them through an, a, a radio frequency field up to a speed that is close to the speed of light. So the electrons get uh, uh, very high energy. You smash them into a, a slab of uh, uh, tungsten, which is Wolfram in Swedish, so a very heavy metal target. And uh, with some weird physics, the electron beam changes from, or, or rather turns into uh, X-ray radiation or gamma radiation, you can also call it. And the gamma radiation or the, the X-ray radiation that comes out here is uh, treated a little bit. You have a filter to shape the beam to get the right, uh, right uh, uh, shape of the field and the right strength. And you have a collimator, so you can aim the beam towards the patient. And the whole idea is to, to hit the patient at the right spot and kill the cancer tumor. Um, <laughs> I, I actually like uh, the right picture here. It is a patient down there. And uh, to me, this looks like something from a James Bond movie. This is like the, the villains and the, and the machine and James Bond is lying there, just waiting to get, get killed by the machine. Um, the left machine is actually a, a bit, maybe a bit less scary looking. Um, that picture is from the first ever radiotherapy treatment with a, with a linear accelerator. And the guy or the boy there is the first patient that ever received a radiotherapy treatment from a LINAC device. From R1, any pictures from R1? Uh, no, but I've seen them where you have uh, R1 is the research uh, nuclear reactor at KTH, and uh, they sometimes put patients under the reactor to for treatment. Is that what you're thinking about? Yeah, it's uh, not the linear accelerator, but another kind of radiotherapy. Yeah, also looks extremely scary. And anyway, this picture is from the 1950s and. Uh, 
the first ever medical use of a linear accelerator. So to go back to the, the Therac line of devices, by the way, am I too loud? Should I? Okay, thumbs up, good. So in the 1970s, you had two companies from France and Canada that uh, did some uh, joint development on uh, uh, these Linux. And uh, the first two models were called Therac 6 and Therac 20. And 6 and 20 is uh, the amount of uh, mega electron volts of uh, energy of the, the X-ray beam. So that's where the numbers come from. And this was really the shit back in the 1970s. This is like the best uh, radiotherapy machines you can buy. And the, the device on the picture is the Therac 6 model, the first one. And uh, already back then, it was like a million dollar for, or multi-million dollar for one of these devices. So some uh, technical details about these two early machines. They were controlled by, by a PDP-11 computer, a 16-bit computer. And, uh, the computer was mainly used as a user interface to make, make them easier to use, but they were, the computers weren't really needed to operate them. And they can still be run standalone. And uh, most importantly, the safety was handled by hardware. The computer were not, was not involved at all in any safety aspects of the machine. And, and uh, I will come back to this later, as you might imagine. So the Fairark 25 was the next device they were going to develop in the, uh, between the 1970s and 1980s. And uh, this time they decided, oh, let's use the computer for a lot of things. It's cheap. We have uh, uh, software developers and it's quicker to modify it on the hardware. So why not use the software for the safety related parts as well? It's, yeah, what can go wrong? And we already have a lot of code lying around from the previous machine, so, so we can copy paste that code. And all of this is, is uh, written in assembler. So, uh, yeah, why not reuse the code? It's, that's fine, right? They launched it in 1982 and they sold 11 of them. And as I said, they were quite expensive. So I think they may, still made a lot of money even only out of 11 devices. So a little bit more about the machine itself. We had three modes of operation. And the first one called field light is uh, when the operator is aiming the machine towards the patient. So it was, a regular light bulb shining a dot onto the target. And then the, the operator would move the target and the machine around until you aimed it at the right position of the patient. So no radiation, only a beam of light. And the other two modes is the two different kinds of uh, therapies that I talked about before, electron and X-ray, depending on what kind of tumor you want to, to uh, uh, treat. Um, the way you change between electron beam and X-ray beam is more or less just that you move these targets and the, the beam filter out of the way of the electron beam, and then the beam will go straight to the patient instead with pure electrons. And you need to do some adjustments on the electron cloud here, because if you don't have a slab of metal here, you will get a pretty strong electron beam. So you need to, uh, to lower the current when you use electron mode. And in X-ray mode, you need a higher current. And we're talking about 100 times higher and lower. The user interface of the machine is, was not a GUI, but a TUI. And uh, you use the, the keyboard to navigate. And for example, here you see the beam type is electron. So you use the arrow keys to move around you enter the values, you hit enter, and then you had some shortcut buttons to start the beam and do other things. So this was, this was quite user-friendly back in the days. And I mentioned the bugs and that they had consequences. So there were a bunch of accidents, at least six of them that are known. Maybe more happened that are not, not really known to the public yet. And all of them happened in, in the mid 80s. So the devices had been in the field for three years already. The first two one, the patients felt uh, pain and like they had been electrocuted or got a, like a flash or something. 
And um, a few days or weeks later, they, uh, they got the radiation burns on their bodies and the doctors could see that this is actually from radiation, it's not an electrical burn. And you can also see that the tissue was actually damaged all the way through the patient. So um, um, I think in this accident, one of the patients had to replace the whole hip, for example, and the other one got his whole arm paralyzed. So we're talking about pretty serious uh, injuries here. And um, um, the doctors and the operators at the hospital, they did some calculations based on the injuries and said that these patients uh, received approximately 100 times more dose, uh, radiation dose than they were intended. So they investigated it and uh, no one ever really managed to reproduce the, uh, the problem they saw. And uh, so not the hospital and not, also not the manufacturer. So they started to think what could be the, the probable cause here. And, and uh, remember these beam stopper and the filter metal parts I showed before? They had some micro switches, electrical switches that were sensing if they were in or out of position. And for redundancy, they had not only one, but three micro switches. And they figured that maybe there was a malfunction in the micro switch. So um, yeah, hopefully that's, that's the cause. So let's uh, improve the software a little bit to, to mitigate this problem that we be believe is the root cause to, to the accidents. So they did that and they did, um, at least to me, a quite weird uh, calculation and saying that, okay, our machine is now five orders of magnitude safer than before. <laughs> and um, yeah, I'm not really sure how they did that math, but that's, that's how they pitched it at least. So uh, yeah, all good and fine. And also remember, they never found the root cause. They, never, they, they could never reproduce this bug. So they were a little bit in the dark. And indeed they were. Another accident happened, uh, similar to the other ones. The, the, the patient got an overdose and the manufacturer said, it's impossible, it can't happen. We just made it so much more, like thousands of percents more safe. How can this ever happen? And uh, in this case, the, the patient survived, but again, with, with uh, pretty severe injuries. Again? <laughs> so what, I mean, what the heck? <laughs> Cut that out hard later. Um, the thing with these two accidents is that they happened at the same hospital. So the staff realized that this wasn't a one-time thing. It actually happened, that's happened to us twice. Um, we killed two patients, so we need to do something. And... Uh, uh, so they started to, to look into it and first they were figuring, could it be something with the electrical wiring again? And they checked it, but no, it's not. The manufacturer now claimed that no, we haven't seen any other accidents, even though this was the fourth one. So the manufacturer was either not really telling the truth or they weren't really communicating internally. And they said, it's still impossible to overdose a patient, so it can't be our machine. And the next accident, they, they really started to try to go to the bottom with this. So the staff at the hospital started to play around. They became software testers. And eventually they managed to reproduce the problem. And it had something to do with timing, not the sequence of operations, but the sequence and um, how, at what time you do them. So hmm, race condition, perhaps? And um, to understand the potential race condition here, we need to talk a little bit about the software architect in, in this uh, uh, machine. They made their own little operating system or a scheduler. They had the different tasks of different priorities and they had uh, uh, eight subroutines that were handling all the treatment related, like the really advanced and important stuff in the program. And um, the scheduler ran every 100 milliseconds, checking if there was any other task of higher priority that should run. And it also got interrupted by uh, keyboard interrupts and other interrupts as usual. So, um, and they used shared variables for task and subroutine communication. And I think you, 
might figure wh where this is going now. And the software was developed by one person who had left the company as well. And no, they had some documentation, but not a lot. And uh, it is claimed that, that this person is still unknown. It's claimed, at least. And uh, probably that person is a little bit ashamed. So the sequence of events that uh, the hospital staff actually figure this, I made it into a sequence diagram to, to suit developers. Uh, operator, machine, and the patient. Uh, if you were about to, to give the patient an electron, electron beam treatment, but you accidentally selected X-ray, uh, then this uh, metal target in the electron beam started to move out or in to the beam. But that took eight seconds to finish. If you then change the mode on the user interface within these eight seconds, um, then you actually triggered a race condition, potentially triggered a, a race condition. So when the machine actually was finished here, the state, the state of the machine was not really what, what the computer thought it was. The, but the machine still said it's ready to beam, the operator started, and then the machine said, malfunction 54, which is not very user-friendly to, to, um, uh, to see on your screen. And the operator were taught that whenever you got certain kind of, of uh, errors, it was safe to proceed again. You didn't need to do anything, just hit the proceed button. So yeah, let's try again. And then, of course, the patient got, got this 100 times stronger electron beam um, shot towards, towards themselves. So if we go back again to, to this uh, linear accelerator, again, these uh, metal parts here, they are out of the way of the beam. And remember, we need to set the low current here. But due to this race condition, the, the electron gun current was set to the high setting. So this is, this is what happened. And the reason being that this one was not an in instantaneous move, it took some time. The subroutines used, used uh, shared variables between them and not much uh, protection or, or like uh, thread safety or anything was implemented in the software. So the continue of, of the investigation, the manufacturers said that this malfunction 54 that they received, that was only meant for testing, like our internal debugging. So it wasn't even meant to happen in the real world. And I guess that's happened to all of us, like forgetting some debug things in the code. And I see people nodding here. So it's not only me. Um, and they managed to, to uh, reproduce the same problem on the previous machine, the CR20. But that one had the hardware interlocks because that one didn't rely on the software. So that machine was safe, even though it had a problem, it never um, caused harm to the patient because the machine would just refuse to start the beam. So the problem was already there, but, but um, it didn't manifest because you had um, secondary systems in, in addition to the software. So the manufacturer had to do something. The, the authorities, the FDA in the US were, were onto them. So they sent out a letter to all the users. And remember, when you change the mode of the machine, you use the arrow keys and then confirm. So remove the up key from the keyboard. <laughs> this is serious. This is actually what they said. Mechanically remove the key, because then you can't go back and change values. And yeah, the authorities were not very happy with this. <laughs> you, could, you, could, uh, you could do better. Yeah, anyway, now first they had this uh, five orders of magnitudes improvement. Now they dis did this, they even removed the, the, the key from the keyboard and they did a lot of other things. So nothing more can happen now. No? A sixth accident, and it wasn't exactly the same as the, the previous two ones, but more similar to, to uh, one that happened in, in the early days. And this patient died, unfortunately. Another investigation started, and the manufacturer said, hey, you didn't update the, the patch. You didn't apply the patch we sent you with, with our new and improved software. But 
it turned out that it wasn't the same problem. It was actually yet another race condition. So it wasn't, um, um, it wasn't the same sequence as, as before, but a second bar. Um, the source code in Assembler is still not public, as far as I know. So I made a little bit of conceptual code here on how the code was implemented based on people investigating this, uh, this accident back in the days. And um, you have a setup machine function that is called over and over again in the task scheduler. Remember, every 100 milliseconds. It's checking some condition, setting a global flag that is later checked in the keyboard interrupt handler. And if the flag is zero, you start the beam. And anyone see problems here? Yes, that's one of them. Well, that's the most important of them. Yeah, you have wrap around that. This is an 8-bit variable. And uh, um, I mean, using shared global variables in an interrupt handler uh, without any, any uh, like uh, um, protection again against uh, different parts of the program updating at the same time is not very good. So yes, every 256 times this loop was called. If you happen to press the, uh, uh, the key at the right time, this might happen. And also, they used an increment operator because that was cheaper Remember, this was uh, assembler and machine code, so an increment is easier than assigning it a fixed value. If this would have been flag equals one, then this couldn't happen, at least not in the same way. So it's actually uh, at least two problems with this, this piece of code. And how could this happen? What, what was the, the root cause of not the accidents, but the things leading up to the accidents? If we start with, with the manufacturer, what, what did they do when they designed the system? And this, this was part of their risk analysis. Program software does not degrade due to wear fatigue or reproduction process. It basically means that the software, once you have created it, it can never go wrong, which is kind of true as long as you don't have bit rot. It's, uh, uh, the, the program should do the same thing every time, so yeah. Maybe. This is interesting. Computer execution errors are caused by faulty hardware. So they are basically saying that all the, the execution errors, depending on what you mean with execution, but they, they more or less mean that all, everything that goes wrong is because of faulty hardware. It can't be the software. Um, this is the only thing that I, that I can actually uh, give them uh, some, some kind of um, right for that you could have random errors because we're dealing with radiation and CPUs and especially RAM memories are quite sensitive to radiation. So yeah, this could happen. The other two, I don't really agree that that's a good, good way to, to deal with software risks. We also had a lot of issues with how they were developing this, uh, this whole project. They, they, they didn't even include the software in the risk analysis because it couldn't go wrong, right? And the operators were once over and over again told that this machine is so safe, you never need to worry um, to, to harm a patient. So don't, don't bother about an error message, just try again. And they never did a root cause analysis and they didn't have any way to keep track of bugs or even malfunctions or accidents because the, the, the manufacturer even forgot that they had had three, three previous accidents when the fourth one happened, right? Of course, they didn't have any software test plan and no code review because it was one single poor guy that developed this software. So there was a lot of, of uh, problems here. Also some issues with the design and the engineering itself. You, you put all the trust and all the safety in, in the software instead of using hardware. And the error messages, malfunction 54, doesn't tell you anything. And of course, no hardware interlocks as they had used on the previous uh, models. And uh, the software inputs, they thought that the micro switches were faulty, 
but they didn't have any other way to check if, if the position was correct or not. They didn't have any secondary independent sensor at all. And of course, maybe one of the most important things here, they thought that their previous software was so safe because the previous machines had been on the market for quite some years and they didn't have this problem. So the software must be bug free, right? Eventually, the FDA forced them to do so many changes in the machine and, and uh, eventually they uh, applied all these fixes. They also added all the, the missing hardware interlocks, the redundancy and everything. And after that, no, no accidents have, have happened uh, that we know about at least. And to be fair, I need to give them that these machines probably saved more lives than they took. But still, you shouldn't go to a hospital and be killed by the hospital. So still not a good machine. The question is, who's at fault here? Usually, this, when you, when you tell, tell people about this bug, everyone says, oh, that was a, a, a poor program. It's that's, uh, like not well designed. But is it really only the, the software developer? It's a lot of things here, or a lot of um, uh, people, or systems, or processes that should prevent this from happening. Even if one person makes a mistake, other people or processes should detect this mistake. And eventually the machine itself should, should detect problems when, uh, when it's in the field in the hospital. So, what happened after these accidents? Because this, this is, was actually the start of when people started to take software development in the medical field seriously. So they, they uh, introduced new standards and new, new ways of working in the medical industry. And uh, they create, eventually created this standard, IEC 62304, which didn't come until in the 2000s, but there were other standards before that. Um, <clears throat> And the standard um, tells you how to develop your software, what kind of processes you need to have, how you develop software, and the safety classification. Like a class A software, for example, you don't need to be as careful because it can't really harm a patient. But a class C, you can kill a patient. So you can spend more effort and more rigor into the more important parts of your software. And it, points out pretty clearly what you need to do, and not only when you develop software, but also how you handle the whole life cycle, how you design it, how you do the architecture, how you develop, how you handle bugs, how you do releases, and also how, how, you, how you deal with accident or bug reports coming from the field. When someone has a problem, there's procedures on how to, to uh, deal with them, how to report, how to fix them, and how to prove that you have actually fixed them. And uh, people might think that, oh, regulated uh, um, areas of, of software must be so hard to work with. But I kind of disagree a little bit because if you read this standard, you're actually free to use any kind of software method methodology as you want. You can use Waterfall, you can use Agile, you don't, you're not forced to use one single. You can use the tools that you want to, to use. You can use open source compilers. You, can, you don't need to use certified tools. As long as you do your homework, as long as you, you have checked like bug reports, you, you have checked that this compiler is trusty and these tools are, are good to use, your, your um, bug reporting system has the traceability, et cetera. And they introduced a new concept called software's unknown pedigree or provenance, which is reused software. Software from a previous project or software you find online on GitHub or wherever. And that is actually fine to use. You can, you can go, go to uh, GitHub, use a library from there in your medical product, as long as you've done your homework, as long as you have checked uh, that it's safe, that it's fit for purpose and done your safety analysis on your software. Um, it, it is still good. And a, lot of, a lot of the medical uh, um, companies out there are using open source tools, for example. So what does it mean for you in your everyday job as a developer? It means that we, you need to document how you work, your coding style, your coding guidelines. Um, you, you, uh, you can decide the tools you want to use. You should use best practices. 
testing, unit testing, integration testing, everything. And uh, again, you need to analyze the code you use before you use it, think twice. And uh, um, yeah, of course, and document what you're doing, like design specifications, architecture, basically everything that should exist in all larger software projects. So to me, when I started in the medical field, I actually got a little bit surprised that hmm, this is what everyone should do to the level that fits your project, of course. So going back, the lessons learned here is don't assume that just because you have used this code for a long time doesn't mean that it's correct or safe because doing the same thing all over again doesn't mean it's doing the right thing when you use it in some other context or another system. Do your risk analysis, testing. Make sure you have ways to do logging when the, the things are in the field. And this is pretty obvious to ask developers, but when you have a, a person died, you, a person that has, has died, you really need to know what, what, what went, went wrong there. Keep it simple when you do your design. It, you, you remove a lot of bugs just keeping it simple. And be humble. Don't claim that your things are safe when you don't know that it's safe, or you, you can actually never claim that it is safe at all. So, I mentioned that we're hiring, right? Um, I work in the control systems uh, team at Electa and uh, we develop these kind of things. And this is um, the collimator part of the machine that shapes the beam into the exact shape to fit the tumor. So, this is one, one of the few things that I'm allowed to share that, uh, of, of the inside of the machine. And it's a lot of embedded software and we use C++ a lot, a little bit of C as well. So if you're interested in what, what we're doing, ask me or any of my colleagues who happen to be here as well. So thank you. Questions? <laughs> Question? Is any formal methods? Is any formal methods? You mean to prove correctness? Um, not in the parts that I'm working in. Maybe other teams are using it, the ones that, that do more algorithmic uh, implementations, for example, but uh, we don't. But you could, you don't need to. We don't use stochastic models for that, but we have various ways of like doing the testing and a lot of the things are like reasonably straightforward and you can do like an, an, a risk analysis and error analysis and error model and FMEA, et cetera, of it. So it's more of a, like a traditional approach to it. Deterministic. Yeah, yeah, usually. <laughs> oh, sorry, that's uh, no pun intended there. <laughs> Usually we use deterministic ways. Yeah. Expanding uh, from like, this uh, incident and completion investigation, like how much time do you do to things so, like uh, figure out? Oh, the, the question is how long time it took for, from the investigation to implement the fixes. Uh, I don't remember exactly, but like uh, a year, I would guess at least. Uh, sorry? Uh, not when you fix it, but when you like figure out what is going on actually. You, you mean how long time it took to figure out what went wrong? Yeah. yeah. And you're talking about the theoric? Uh, race condition logistics. Yeah. I, I don't know exactly how long time it took, but it, at least it took them just testing it to, to try to recreate a problem, it took them days or a week just to, just to be able to recreate a bug in the first place. And then I guess it took them a month until they, they could actually trace it down to the source code. The problem is quite clear, you kind of uh, incorrect, it incorrect more. So I just wonder, does it, like your machine doesn't write any only during the treatment that important? Oh, you mean if the machine wrote a log, for example? That would have been clever, yep. So as far as I understand, these machines, they saved screenshots of the user interface. But 
the user interface showed the wrong information. So that wasn't too good. So it had some kind of logging mechanism, but not as much as they wanted. And this computer had like um, 32 uh, kilobytes of memory or something. So, so they claimed that they didn't have enough uh, RAM to uh, implement logging or they were lazy, I don't really know. But with the proper log, then they would have fixed it earlier for sure. Yeah, sort of just a comment. It seems that there's this, uh, now we are, we know that software is never bug free. It seems like this is like a time where maybe we didn't, haven't learned that yet. Yeah. It's like a shift. Because they, they obviously thought that this, we've done the work. Mm -hmm. this, but now we know that there's no such thing as a bug free software. Yep. That, that kind of shift. Yeah. That's maybe why they didn't investigate. Too. Yeah, yeah. So the comment was that that when this was designed, they, they uh, kind of weren't aware that software could actually never be bug free. So uh, I totally agree. And maybe what's happening today is today we have AI, for example, and we know that that's not perfect either. But we might not know other things that AI might might lead to in the next five ten years. So maybe we have another. Th similar thing that's going to happen with whatever we th we believe is good today. So yeah, good comment. Oh yeah, the UK Postal Service. Yes, yes. Uh, in uh, using some passcode, uh, you were talking about external libraries being quite like super common. Mm. Uh, do you like having special methods to like check for memory corruption issues and stuff like that? Like that software. Yeah, yeah. So the question was, when you use uh, external libraries, do do you check for like memory corruption, for example? And yes, you can do that, uh, or we do that, and you, you also do that in your own code as well. <clears throat> but when you use a, a third-party components, it's also that you you need to look into the source code. You need to check the bug list. You need to see is it actively maintained. How much is it used in which kind of field? So, and, and there are certain procedures and certain steps you need to do in order to, to even be able to say yes or no to this piece of software. And I don't remember all the steps now, but it's quite rigorous before you can even consider it. Yeah. And then you can do whatever other tests you want because that's part of your test plan and test and verification plan as well. Okay, I think you are next in line. Okay, exceptions, multi-threading and allocation, if I have any particular opinions, uh, yes, it depends. <laughs> it's, uh, <laughs> but it's, it's actually true, and that's also part of your risk analysis. Um, you can do uh, allocations, for example, as long as you can show that this only happens in uh, um, uh, when you are not treating a patient, for example, then it could be safe to use, uh, I mean, whatever, as long as you have some point where you can actually check that the whole system is functional, functional and, and correct, then you can use it. But then you have parts of the software that might be more critical where you don't want to do allocations. Um, you might not want to use exceptions either. You can use other ways. So yeah. It, it all depends what, what the software is doing, but usually you have like parts of the software where you really need to be more careful. And also, I think one key difference between medical devices and, for example, airplanes is that we can stop. If anything goes wrong, we can always, or, or the hardware or the software can always cut the power, and then you, you get into a safe state. You don't want to do that with an airplane, for example. So, even if you throw an exception, even if you didn't mean to throw an exception, you can still stop the machine and then you're safe. Thanks for your Thank you.